Hello and welcome to Cable Plus Property, your number one online educative platform on all issues related to land and landed properties. As you know, my name is Oiza and at Cable Plus Property, our aim is to ensure that all Nigerians and non-Nigerians have at the tip of your finger every information related to land acquisition, land procurement, documentation, getting your properties registered and obtaining your planning permit. In this video, I'll be speaking with the number one and number two of the Nigerian Institute of Architects, Lagos State chapter. I mean, architect David Maja Kodumi. He's the chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architects, Lagos State chapter, and architect Abiodun Fatui. He's the vice chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architects, Lagos State chapter. It's good to have you, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. So, um, with minimal consent from the government so to say how has or how is the architects and other professionals in the built environment how are you collaborating to work together and how has that reduced the incidence of building collapse in nigeria generally uh, thank you very much uh dated back as 2008 uh, i must say i must give a kudos to the state because uh the professional bodies in the construction industry are more relevant and I cannot authoritatively tell you that we're working together. Even both in the public sector and in the private sector because there's so much synergy between us where we communicate. It's not just attending seminars but you find out that even for the government doing something they always get the private sectors or, you know, where we have a talk, brainstorming. Um, like, one of the good uh, things that the Lagos State has embarked on lately is looking into uh, green architecture, looking at eco, uh, how will I put it? Um, environmental? Eco, eco, ecological, you know, environment. I think everyone is thinking green, you know. Um, which is well practiced in the global world today. And they involve all the professionals, you know, having all this webinar talking about how do we find solution, how do we reduce the emission. And I think that's the best way to start. You know. So there's that synergy between the professional bodies. And it's clearly stated not only in the regulation. Maybe we'll talk about the National Building Code later. Yes. The no, National Building Code that. clearly stated the roles of every professional in the built environment. So when a building collapse happens, a building collapse incident happens, people lose lives and properties. How are the people who turn out as victims of this collapse, do they get compensated at all or do they get help? So building collapse um, happens as a result of negligence for some causes. Um, uh, that's what in our last uh, meeting we spoke about the architect's insurance. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if they have such covers, that maybe they have life insurance or depending on where they're working. But uh, when you say compensation, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure uh, you will compensate somebody for not doing his job properly. You know. I'm, I'm talking of the victims now. The Most families. Of the victims. Can I comment okay. on that now? It's all recommended to the government. But if the government has done the needful, we will be asking the question, the victim will they become compensated? Okay. Ideally, ideally, it's all stated. It's in the book. But is following it to the last dot. You as a client, you as a contractor, you must have all risk insurance. What does all risk insurance stand for? In case there are accident. So for every worker on the site must be protected. That all risk insurance takes care of that. Also, your professional indemnity insurance, or what we can call professional liability insurance. Because due to negligence, your negligence, your 
medications should be able to cover what the damage you brought through your negligence. But ordinarily, between you and I, <laughs> you will able to go outside there now. We want to get our car insurance. Instead of you doing a comprehensive insurance for a car that you bought worth 5 million naira. Ah, they said to me that the comprehensive insurance is 500,000 naira. Where will I get the fund? So you do third party insurance or third party fire and theft. So it's more to do with the enforcement. Now, at the submission, or at the approval stage, moving to site, part of the requirement of the government must see is all risk insurance. Now, I talk about the accredited checkers, accredited or third party certifier. Now, a good example, the three of us, I'm the one that designed your house. The government hasn't got the manpower to, but you can now ask architect building factory to be the accredited checker. But, the building factory must have that professional indemnity insurance or professional life because it's taking a lot of risk mm. and is insurance must be able to co cover the cost of your so do you I see love. where the you know everyone needs to be compensated mm. even you have ordinary accidents in the office whether you sleep down i mean all this are taken care of you have the, you know, it's stated in the it's stated in the law, but there's no enforcement. Mm. Which is a big problem. Mm. Yes. I and it's good we're having this awareness. So if you are to explain to our viewers in mm -hmm. layman's language, um, what is required to put up a building that has an architect on it? Okay, um putting up a building in relation to the role of an architect now, what does it require to put up a building? Okay, so uh, first of all, um, the client must have done some some things. He must have gotten his um, land documents okay. properly. Um, he must have a fair idea of what he wants, uh, and then he will engage an architect and give him what we call the design brief. No, sorry, the client brief. Is that the a, client brief? A, a client must have an idea of what he wants. What if I don't know what I want? I just have a piece of land and it oh, wants a building on it. Is oh. there something, can you design something? Like yes, yeah, sure. So, so like the chairman had said earlier, we will um, go and look at what the building regulations of that area, okay. you know, allows for. And then we will um, sit down with the client and see if he has a budget, to see how we can design to suit his budget mm -hmm. and as well meet up with what the government is saying we can do, or what the regulations will allow us to do. Um, so we we'll, um, you know, listen to his thoughts and see how best we can creatively achieve uh, whatever vision we can we can get from him. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, so as I was saying, once you get the client brief, we we'll go back and inter in interpret it vis-a-vis -vis the government regulations and um, available land space, and then we'll come back with our own design brief. So that design brief is what you. <coughs> like the chairman says, hey. This area is cut out for commercial activities. Mm -hmm. He wants to build uh, residences. That's what he told us. You can't do that because government is <coughs> not good houses here. Why did he insist? He can't insist because the law is the law. Uh, yes. So what, is, what, is, what if he insists? There's a way around it. Okay. And the way around it is to apply for change of use. You see, the law accommodates change of use. But you must be able to back it up with enough evidence. Now, let's give an example. Now, I see so many coaches of, I don't want to mention the name of the church, but it says for every mile you go, there must be that branch there. Mm. And at the same time, there's a need for all the things in that area. Now, for them to have built that church, they must have got an approval. So, one, they've applied for change of use. Also, when there is a need to the community, you see the government acquire lands for what? For public use. So when you see that, okay, we need a school here, because the next school within this vicinity is 10 miles away. I mean, things like that, you can make a case. Are you with me? 
So there can be an application for change of use, and when that is granted, we can do it. But in some cases, no. Now, uh, talking about also just to buttress of what you ask him, what does he require? You know, in a layman's view, apart from getting your land documents perfected, the first point of call should be the government table, that is the Fiscal Planning Permit Authority, which he said, yes, even, even if you don't have a brief, he makes up the brief, but he goes to confirm at the Fiscal Planning Authority to say, oh, we're building four family dwelling units here. Well, are we going to get the permit? I practice in England, and that's the way it's done. Even in my practice, we still do adopt that stuff. So from there, you will have been able to know that, yes, you can only do a block of four flats here. You can't do a block of 16 flats. You understand? Then other professionals has to be involved. Make your clients realize you need to test the soil. You understand? And after that, that's where you now, you know what kind of structure you put. Then also, what is also missing which is in the book, is all in the law. When you make an application for approval, it's supposed to be publicized in the newspaper, a well-read newspaper. Your community is supposed to know. I'll give a good example. There's a Nigerian church in England that applied to build this church in Dagenham. And at the end of the day, the community alone put up a, you know, a petition, not a petition, but they carry them along to say, we are going to have this church in. And the community said, ah, this will disturb the traffic. And mm. At the end of the day, the church was given a temporary approval for two years, pending the time when it finds a suitable place. And with the condition, the condition of that approval for two years is that, yes, you can have this church here because it's your land. And it's been earmarked for church. But we never thought this would be highly residential in the future. But since that is highly residential and we've carried the community along, we shall not allow any parking or any whatever in this church. All you can allow is 10 shuttle. So you find out that the government provides maybe 10 miles away a parking for 500 or two. It's one of these big churches in Nigeria. For 500 cars, and you take the shuttle. So it's only the shuttle you see in front of the church, which reduce the traffic, reduce the parking. And maybe I think two years or thereabout, this church find a suitable place that the law allows it to do everything. So that's another thing that is missing. We have it. We are taught in school. A lot of things missing. <laughs> so that leads us to the National Dream Code you mentioned earlier. What is it about and what role does it play in the beauty environment? How does it help professionals to do their work? Thank you very much. Um, the Na National Building Code, all is all about, it gives the minimal requirement for materials to be used for the labor, for the workmanship, and the standard, the quality. And I'll still repeat, because each time they ask me this question, not that I get angry, but it's sad. And let me give you a little history of the National Building Code. The National Building Code is prepared by the professionals in the built environment. For Nigeria, the National Building Code has been since 1986. 20 years after Nimiko, Dr. Nimiko was the minister, he signed the National Building Code. Hmm? That's 20 years after. What year are we now? So How many years after? 16 years after. 16 years, 16 plus 20. 26. As I'm talking to you, there is no enabling law to enforce this national building code. And at this stage, we are all advocating for domestication of the national building code. Let me now expand on the domestication. 
see, domestication of the National Building Code will kind of uh, more to do with Ikorudu compared to Victoria Island, compared to Ikeja, because the local climate in Victoria Island is different to that of Ikorudu. Even the the soil in Ikorudu is different to the soil in Sabo. So that's when you domesticate the national building code. But don't you think it's pathetic? Don't you think it's sad? And what does our national assembly do? When the other uh, building collapse happened in Kordu the other day, that was when we heard that the national assembly is having the first reading or the second reading of the national building code. Is it, is it until when lives are lost? Mm -hmm. Or when the family of the government or whatever is there oh. is involved that will now wake up? It's so sad. So that's what the National Building Code says. And not only that, it gives the duty of every professional in the built environment is well clearly stated. How relevant is it particularly to building collapse? It is because number one, it talks about the quality. It talks about the workmanship. Uh, let me give you a good example. Now, if the material used are texted, that is, it met the requirement, because that National Building Code says what the strength of the concrete will be. Mm -hmm. Now, it tells you what the quality, the material of the door you are using will be. Now, we get fire hazard. And ideally, God forbid, if fire happens here, yeah, at least this room is supposed to be protected maybe for half an hour or an hour. And what will protect it is the material used. So your doors must be fire rated, your windows must be fire rated, your all the elements ceiling must be fire rated. All these are clearly stated in the National Building Code. So if you adhere to that National Building Code, God forbid, don't you think we've been able to evacuate someone? I mean, uh, there's an incident that happens in England some few years ago about the material used for the cladding. But the casualty was minimized. Also, maybe a good example in UK or, you know, you find out that quite a number of, if you travel abroad, you find out in most of the houses you see wooden floor. That is the reason for it. Now, and the lesson was learned during the London fire, I think in the, in the early 40s or so. Now, where you have a slab, a concrete slab, you know it's heavier than having a wooden floor. When building collapsed, the weight of that, everything came in. But when that happened, when the fire incident, when it was collapsing, everything shit out because of the light materials the wooden. You see, all these are clearly stated in the National Building Code. The size of the reinforcement you use, if you want to use a wooden floor, the size of the wooden floor, how will you protect this wood against fire? Fire rated is clearly stated. For you to have this board or whatever, you must have, you know, a certain thickness of uh, insulating or fire insulating material in, you know, in this element you are creating. We have a long way to go. Yes, we but do. It's sad because we go to school, we learn all this in school, but to enforce it. Exactly. And a lot of our politicians or those in power, even where they didn't, where they didn't, uh, where they're not trained abroad, quite a number of them in their course of uh, job, they've been sent abroad. But when they go abroad, maybe it's another thing they go to look at. Because I, I can authoritatively tell you I'm, I'm part of, and I'm aware there was a time, at least we call them 100 of us, about 100, uh, about 100 of the staff of the development control uh, in Lagos State were sent abroad to Singapore to see how they enforce the law. But unfortunately, when they get back, maybe six months to their retirement or one year to their retirement, and we should have taken the younger ones who are still going to be in the service, maybe for maybe five or another ten years. But quite a number of those who went on that 
trip, maybe retired <laughs> within two years. Thank you too for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and uh, like this video, share with friends and family. Also head on to our Facebook page and Instagram, follow at Cable Plus Property. My name is Oiza and I'll see you next time.